All right, so now we are back. I got my water, a couple other things, and we're with number two, authority. The simple collection and narration of events is being more and more regarded today as a preparation rather than as the goal in dealing with history. In opposition to the positivist conception of science, there is an ever more decisive acceptance of the demand that the presentation of history should not be a stringing together of isolated facts which represent essentially subjective capabilities, the taste, and the outlook of a historian, but the application of consciously methodo methodical work which rests on theoretical knowledge. To the extent that both these changes have taken place, authority proves ever more clearly to be a dominant category in the historian's apparatus of determining men's opinions than people are inclined to believe. The great in attention presently being given to authority may be conditioned by the special historical circumstances of our time, and especially by the rise of so-called authoritarian forms of the state. But in this historical situation, we are nonetheless confronted with a reality that has been decisive in the whole of the past history as well. In all the forms of society which have developed out of the undifferentiated primitive communities of prehistory, either a few men dominate, as in relatively early and simple situations, or certain groups of men rule over the rest of people, as in more developed forms of society. In other words, all these forms of society are marked by the superordination or subordination of classes. The majority of men have always worked under the leadership and command of minority, and this dependence has always found expression in a more wretched kind of material existence for them. We have already pointed out that the simple coercion alone does not maintain such a state of affairs and that men have learned to approve of it. Amid all the radical differences between human types from different periods of history, all have in common that their essential characteristics are determined by the power relationships prior to society at any proper to society at any given time. Pre people have for more than a hundred years abandoned the view that the character is to be explained in terms of a complexly, completely isolated individual. Uh, and now they regard man at every point as a socialized being. But this also means that men's drives and passions, their characteristic depositions, and reaction patterns are stamped by the power relationships under which the social life process unfolds at any time. The class system within which the individual's outward life runs its course is reflected not only in his mind, his ideas, his basic concepts and judgments, but also in his inmost life and his preferences and desires. Authority is therefore a central category for history. The fact that it plays so decisive a part in the life of, life of groups and individuals at all periods in the most divisive, diverse areas of the world is due to the structure of human society up to the present time. Over the whole time stand embraced by historical writing, men have worked in more or less willing obedience to command and direction apart from the marginal instances in which slaves and chains have been whipped onto field and mine. Because the activity which kept society alive and the accomplishment of which men were therefore molded occurred in submission to an external power, all relationships and patterns of reaction stood under the sign of authority. A general definition of authority would, nece would necessarily be almost empty of content, but this is true of almost all definitions which attempt to capture the elements of social life in a way that would be valid for all of history. Such a definition may be more or less apt. It remains, however, not only abstract but distorted and untrue until it is related to all other definitions of social realities. The general concepts which provide a basis for the theory of society can be generally correctly understood only in connection with all the other general and special concepts in theory. That is, they can only be understood as elements in a given theoretical structure. In addition, the interrelationships of all these concepts are continually changing, as are those of the whole logical structure itself to reality. It follows that the concrete, that is, true, definition of such a category is, in the last analysis, the developed theory of this society operates uh, at a historical moment in connection with particular practico-historical tasks. Abstract definitions contain, in unmediated juxtaposition, the unopposed elements of meaning which the concept has accumulated due to historical changes. Thus, for example, the non-historical and theoretically unelaborated concept of religion embraces both knowledge and superstition. The same holds for authority. If we provisionally regard as showing forth authority those internal and external behaviors in which men submit to an external source of command, we can see immediately the contradictory character of this category. Authority behavior may be in the true and conscious interests of individuals and groups, the citizens of a city in antiquity defending themselves against a foreigner evading attack, or any community acting according to a plan under the sign of authority in as much as the individuals do not at each moment make their own judgment but depend on a superordinate plan, which, of course, may have come into existence through their cooperation. Through the whole ages of, mis of history, subordination was in the interest of those who were ruled, as is the subordination of a child who receives a good education. It was a condition for the development of mankind's capabilities, but even at such times as dependence was doubtless suitable in view of state of human powers 
and of the instruments at man's disposal, it has up to now brought renunciations with it for those who are dependent. In periods of stagnation and retrogression, the acceptance of existing, for of existing forms and independence, necessary for the survival of society in this given form, meant for subordinates and the continuation of their intellectual material powerlessness and became a drag on human development generally. Authority has accepted dependence authority as accepted dependence can thus imply a relationship which fosters progress is in the interest of all parties and favors the development of human powers but it can also sum up in one word all those social relationships and ideas which have long since lost their validity and now are artificially maintained and are contrary to the true interests of the majority authority is the ground for a blind slavish submission which originates subjectively in psychic inertia and the inability to make one's own decisions and which contributes objectively to the continuation of constraining and unworthy conditions of life. But authority is also the ground for a consciously accepted and disciplined toil in a flourishing society. Yet these two kinds of existence differ as sleeping is waking, as sleeping and waking, imprisonment and freedom. Only an analysis of the social situation in its totality can provide an answer to certain questions. For, an for example, does the acceptance of an existing relationship of dependence, both in principle and in submission in daily life, even in one's innermost feelings, really correspond to the state of development of a human powers at the time in question? Do men, in acceptance, in acceptance of a depending life, either instinctively with for or with full awareness, deceive themselves about the measure of self-development and happiness they can achieve, or do they help to further measure these goals for themselves and mankind? Is unconditional submission to a political leader or political party historically forward? Uh, point historically forwards or backwards. Uh, the acceptance of rank, which was characteristic of absolutism, in subordination of the middle classes to a princely aristocracy war in the 16th, 17th, and even to some degree in the 18th centuries, a productive factor in historical development, depending on the situation in various countries. In the 19th century, however, such behavior became the mark of reactionary groups. According as the acknowledged dependence is justified by the objective role of the dominant class or on the contrary has lost its reasonable necessity those who practice it will see in comparison with other men of agencies that are alert active productive free or farsighted or slavish interiorly dulled embittered and treacherous according to as the acknowledged dependence is justified by the objective role of the dominant class or on the contrary has lost its reasonable necessity those who practice it will see in comparison with other men of the age either alert active, productive, free, and farsighted, or slavish, interiorly dulled, embittered, and treacherous. But even this correlation cannot be applied mechanically. The psychic significance of the acceptance of authority depends on the role of authority relationship, of authority relationship in its time, on a specific account, and on the degree of differentiation among the individuals it embraces. Furthermore, conscious acceptance or rejection really does not say much about the effects of the relationship on interior life of the, individ of the individual. Some categories of Roman slaves could either accept their slavery without thinking without their thinking becoming slavish. Some some categories of Roman slaves could accept their slavery without their thinking thereby becoming slavish. On the other hand, when the majority of their masters in the time of the Caesars took refuge in a system of military tyrants and submitted them even in cowardly fashion when they turned out too bad, they were already serving notice of their powerlessness on the stage of world history. In any case, the strengthening or weakening of authorities is one of those characteristics which makes the culture a dynamic factor in the historical process. The weakening of relationships of dependence, which are deeply rooted in the conscious and unconscious life of the masses, is amongst the greatest dangers that can threaten a societal structure and indicates the structures become brittle. Conscious exaltion of the status quo is evidence that a society in a critical, is in a critical period and even becomes a main source of den danger. Convulsive efforts to renew and strengthen society, such as the crosses in the Roman arena or the pyres of the Inquisition, signal either the collapse of a social order or a period of stagnation in the human development. Bourgeois thought begins as a struggle against the authority of tradition and replaces it with reason as a legitimate source of right and truth. It ends with the deification in, of naked authority as such, a conception no less empty of determinate content than the concept of reason. Since justice, happiness, and freedoms of mankind would be would have been eliminated as historically possible solutions, if we do not look, if we look not so much to Descartes' subjective intention as to his historical effects, this thinker, regarded as the creator of the first system of the bourgeois philosophy, proves to be a champion <laughs> in the fight against the principle of authority in any kind of thinking. Buckle, a very perceptive and typical historian of bourgeois society, writes of Descartes, he deserves the gratitude of prosperity, not so much on account of what he built up, 
as on account of what he pulled down. His life was one great and successful warfare against the prejudices and tra traditions of men. He was a he was great as a creator, but he was far greater as a destroyer. In this respect, he was the true successor of Luther, to whose labors well, to whose labors his own were the fitting supplement. He completed what the great German reformer had left undone. He bore to the old systems of philosophy precisely the same relation that Luther bore to the old systems of religion. He was the great reformer and liberator of the European intellect. This liberation refers especially to the fight against belief and authority. The mainstream of bourgeois philosophy down to the beginning of the 19th century, despite all of its internal contradictions, is marked by a recurring rejection of authority-motivated behavior. The attack of the English and French Enlightenment on theology is not directed in this great representatives against the acceptance of God's existence as such. Voltaire's deism, for instance, was certainly not insincere, but he could not comprehend the monstrous idea that men ought to acquiesce in earthly justice. His kindness of heart played tricks on the most acute mind of the century. The Enlightenment was not attacking the claim that God exists, but the acceptance of God on pure authority. Locke, instructor in philosophy to the Enlightenment, wrote, Revelation must be judged by reason. Reason must be judged by our last judge and guide in everything. Belief is no proof of revelation. In the last analysis, a man must apply his own intellectual powers and not be dependent on authority. In this sense, Kant, too, belonged to the Enlightenment. Sapere ode, having the courage to use your own reason as its device, according to him, laziness and cowardice are the reasons why, after long after nature has freed men from alien guidance, naturalite maiorenes, uh, so many are content to live their lives as minors and why it is so easy to set themselves up as their guardians. For Kant, the moral law expresses nothing else than the autonomy of the pure practical reason, for example, freedom. The whole content of Fichte's philosophy, if we are to take his word, consists in a call to be interiorly dependent, to put aside all views and behaviors that are based solely on authority. For all bourgeois writers, the most contemptuous description of man is a slave. And this holds especially for Fichte, Fichte whatever the fuck. Uh, his stress on interior freedom, still linked with the vehement and rather utopian will to change the world, corresponds to the attitude especially widespread in Germany, which comes to terms with the external op oppression by affirming the freedom within one's own heart and stressing more strongly the independence of the spiritual person. The more the real person is enslaved. His stress on interior freedom, still linked with the vehement and rather utopian will to change the world, corresponds with the attitude especially widespread in Germany, which comes to terms with the external oppression affirming the freedom within one's own heart and by stressing more strongly the independence of the spiritual person the more real a person is enslaved interesting when one became too painfully aware of the contradiction between inward and outward one could effect a reconciliation by bringing the interior self into harmony with an outside reality rather than subjecting the intractable reality to one's own will if freedom consists in the formal agreement of outward reality and inward decision then it has no thing to fear all that is needed for each person to accept the historical process and his own place in it for contemporary philosophy such as in fact true freedom to accept whatever happens for Fichte, however the refusal of authority-based thinking is not converted into acceptance of reality is given he defines reason as essentially the contrary of authority his message that one must be unwilling to submit sounds admittedly like mere phrase making in comparison with kant and the french in his opposition to the existing order of things already too much a matter to principle to be wholly irreconcilable all the more clearly then at least in his early writings does the ideal of bourgeois thought emerge anyone who acts on authority necessarily acts without principle that is a very important proposition and is urgently necessary to present in its full rigor the circle of people whom the cultivated man addresses has reached an absolute unbelief in the authority of the social convictions of their time the characteristic mark of a cultivated public is absolute freedom in independence of thought, its outlook is formed by the determination to submit to no authority whatsoever and in all matters to rely on its own reflection while rejecting without qualification anything which it cannot thus confirm. The cultivated man is distinguished from the uncultivated in this way. The latter thinks, of course, that he has reached his convictions through his own reflection, and so he has. But you can see further that he than he. You discover but if you can see further than he, you discover that his ideas on state and church follow the opinions of the most current at the time. As well in Ford inquiry is unqualifiedly free, so must access to such inquiry must be openly to everyone else. If a man can no longer give internal credence to authority, it is against his conscience to believe in it further, and it is his moral duty to join the cultivated public. State and church must allow c such cultivated people to go their way. Otherwise they, would have, otherwise, they would be forcing consciences, and no one could live with a good conscience in such a state or a church 
For should he begin to have doubts about authority, he would be helpless to act. Most institutions must accept cultivated people, that is, accept what constitutes their very being, absolute and unlimited communication of ideas. Anything that anyone thinks he is convinced of, he must be able to speak of, however dangerous and profligate, prof, yes, profligate it may seem. Vick made the relationship between reason and authority his criterion for determining the stages of development of mankind. In his characteristics of the present age, he claims that it is the end of the earthly life of the human race to order all its relations with freedom according to reason. He also acknowledges in, his, in this book that his own principle prevails in the bourgeois world, but maintains that it is distorted in the process. The absence of authority, as found among the bourgeoisie, seems to him a yielding of the popular opinion of the day, and thus takes on a two-sided character in his terminology. The initially sharp opposition between reason and authority is increasingly softened by the desire to ground authority in reason. The age of romanticism is the beginning, and fixed thinking affords room for the polarities or unreconciled contradictions of the bourgeois mind, and becomes more and more contemplative. Yet, as late as 1815, he defines progress of history. Thus, reason captures more and more ground from faith until it has wholly annihilated it and taken up its content into the nobler form of clear insight. Reason increasingly batters down the outworks of faith and forces it to withdraw into stronghold in a determined direction and according to a predetermined pattern. We understand the historical age when we can estimate how much the age is shaped by reason, how much by faith and at which precise points the two principles are in opposition. The struggle can only be ended when reason emerges in a fully purified form, that is, eliminates all vestiges of faith. Such a development is the very reality of history, which therefore consists of faith and reason, the conflict between the two, and the victory of reason over faith. That the struggle against dependence on authority should, in modern times, change directly into defecation, de De deification of authority, as such is a development rooted in the origins of the struggle. Authority was the basis in Protestantism for liberation of, from papal power and for a turn to the word. According to Calvinism, the one great offense of man is self-will. All the good of which humanity is capable of is compromise and obedience. You have no choice, thus you must do and no otherwise. Whatever is not a duty is a sin. To one holding his theory, this theory of life, crushing out any of the human faculties, capabilities, and susceptibilities is no evil the independence urged upon men was conceived in an essentially negative way even in secular literatures as a general independence in thought and action from a tradition that had become a straitjacket the intentableness of medieval systems of property and law had become evident in the increasing disproportion between the inadequate results of a feudal mode of production and the growing needs of the masses of people in the city and countryside as well as in the related incapacity of civil and ecclesiastical bureaucracies which had become demoralized and their concerns failed to match the means of an ever more complicated society. The principle which held sway in this world in decline was that worth suspended on pure tradition, that is, birth, custom, and age. That principle was now contested by the rising bourgeois mentality, which instead preached individual accomplishment through theoretical and practical work as a social criterion. But the conditions needed for such accomplishments were not everywhere to be found in the same degree, and so life under the new principle was hard and oppressive despite an enormous growth in the productivity of work. The wretchedness of the masses in the periods of absolutism and liberalism, as well as the hunger that persisted despite a strikingly increased social wealth in the form of new raw materials and methods of production, show that the liberation from tradition was in fact limited to a few. In philosophy, this state of affairs finds expression in the abstractness of the concept of the individual, that basic concept of modern thought. The abstractness emerges clearly in Leibniz, especially the individual is a self-enclosed metaphysical center of power, separated from the rest of the world, an absolutely isolated monad, which is self-dependently made by God. Or, sorry, which is made self-independent by God. Its destiny, according to Leibniz, lies within its own determination, and its stages of development, its happiness or unhappiness, depend on its own internal dynamism. It is responsible for itself, what it is, and what befalls it depends on its own will and God's decree. Such a separation of individuals from society and nature, closely connected with the other philosophical dualisms of thought and being, substance of substance and appearance, body and spirit, sense and understanding, terms the concept of the free individual, which is the bourgeois answer to the Middle Ages, into an almost <gasps> metaphysical sense. The individual is to be handed over to himself, his dependence on the social conditions of real existence is forgotten, and he is regarded, even in the days of absolutism, but especially after its collapse, as sovereign.
Because the individual was regarded as wholly isolated and complete in himself, he could seem that the dismantling of the old authorities was the only thing required if he was to exercise his full potential. In reality, the liberation meant, before all else, that the majority of people were delivered up to the fearful exploitation of the factory system. The self-dependent individual found himself confronted with an external power to which he must accommodate himself. According to theory, the individual is not to acknowledge the judgment of any human authority as binding upon him without first objecting to it the test of reason. In fact, he now stood alone in the world and must adapt himself or perish. The network of relationships itself became authoritative. The Middle Ages had connected the earthly order of things with God's decree and, that, and to that extent regarded it as meaningful. In the modern period, on the contrary, all real situations are brute facts which do not embody any meaning but are simply to be accepted. It is evident that class distinctions were not from God. It is not re yet recognized that they did not arise out of human processes of work. And this distinctions, these distinctions, and the relations connected with them appear to be sovereign. Appear to the sovereign individual, the metaphysical substance of bourgeois thought, to be something alien. They appear to be a self-contained reality, another principle confronting the knowing and acting subject. Bourgeois philosophy is dualist by its very nature, even when it takes the form of pantheism. When it attempts to bridge the gap between self and world by means of thought in present nature and world history as the expression uh, by means of thought and to present nature and history as the expression embodiment or symbol of human essence it is already acknowledging reality as a principle which has m its own rights and is not to be regarded as dependent on man and changeable at his will but meaningful that must but as winning meaningful being that must be interpreted and read like a cryptogram Authorities are allegedly done away with and then reappear philosophically in the form of metaphysical concepts. Philosophy at this point is only a reflection of what has happened in society. Men have been freed from the limitations of the old, divinely sanctioned property system, and the new one is regarded as natural, as the manifestation of a thing in itself which is beyond discussion and eludes human influence. Here, then, is a philosophical system in which the individual is conceived, not in his involvement with society and nature, but abstractly, and as a purely intellectual essence, a being which now must think of the world and acknowledge it as an eternal principle, and perhaps as the expression of his own true, be true being. Precisely in such a system is the imperfection of the individual's freedom mirrored, his powerlessness amid an archaic inhuman reality which is rent by contradictions. The proud claim that no authority has to be recognized unless it can justify itself to reason proves itself to be a flimsy one when the categories of such awareness are subjected to an internal analysis. The, seemingly, the seeming validity of the claim can be shown to derive in two ways from the underlying social reality. It springs in every case of the obscurity of the production process in a bourgeois society, but acquires a different meaning in the life of each of the Sioux social classes involved. The independent entrepreneur is regarded as a free trade economy and it is regarded in a free trade economy as independent in his decisions. What wares he produces, what kind of machines he uses, what how he combines the talents of men and machines, where he decides to build this factory, all this seems to depend on free decision, on the breath of vision and creative energy. The importance assigned to the genius and qualities of leadership in modern economic and philosophical literature derives from the situation just described. I insist, blank, 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 empathetically on the importance of genius and the necessity of allowing it to unfold itself both freely in both thought, thought and practice, says John Stuart Mill, and he adds the widespread complaint that society does not allow genius enough free play. This enthusiasm for genius, which has since become a characteristic of the average man's consciousness could help increase the influence of the great economic leaders because in the present system economic projects are largely a matter of divination that is of hunches for the small scale businessman the situation today is still what it was for the whole class of businessmen during the liberal period in his planning he may indeed draw on earlier experience and find assistance in his own psychological sensitivity and his knowledge of the economic and political sense but when all is said and done the real decision of the value on uh, on the value of his product and thus his own activity depends on the market and necessarily has an irrational element since the market in turn depends on the working and conflicting uh, the working of conflicting and uncontrollable forces the manufacturer in his planning is as dependent on any medieval artisan on the, the needs of society in that he in that respect he is no freer but the lack of freedom is not brought home to him, as it was to the artisan, by the wishes of a limited and set body of customers, or in the form of a demand for service by the lord of a manor. A manufacturer's dependence is expressed instead on the sellableness of his wares in the profit he seeks, and shows its power over him when he balances his accounts at the end of the business year. The exchange value over the product also determines its practical value to the user, insomuch as the material composition of the goods being sold is a measure predetermined by the 
raw materials needed, the machinery of the production which must be kept in repair, and the men required to run these machines. In other words, the value of the wares expresses ascertainable relations between material realities. But in the present orders... But in the present order, this connection between value and society's needs is mediated not only by calculable psychic and political factors, but also by a sum total of countless uncontrollable events. This classical period, the classical period of this states, the classical period of this state of affairs passed with liberalism. In the present age, marked as it is by the struggles of great monopolies rather than as formerly by the competition of countless individuals, the individual capacity to make correct guesses about the market, to calculate and speculate, has been replaced by the extensive mobilization of whole nations for violent confrontations. But the small businessman passes on his uh, own difficulties in the intensified form to the leaders of the industrial trust. And if he himself must continue to maneuver amid oppressive circumstances in order to not go under, then such leaders he thinks must be geniuses to stay on top of the heap. They may learn from personal experiences that, that they must develop in themselves uh, they may learn from personal experiences that what they must develop in themselves is not the spiritual qualities of their predecessors, but what the ruthless steadfastness required if an economic and political oligarchy is to rule the modern masses. In any event, these leaders do not consider social reality to be clear and comprehensible. On the other hand, the population of their own country and of all hostile power groups make their presence felt as dangerous natural forces which must be restrained or cleverly manipulated. Uh, on the other hand, on the other, the mechanisms of the world market are no less perplexing than more limited forms of competition are, and the leaders accept and even promote the belief of their class that to be a master of the economy takes the instincts of a genius. They, too, experience society as a self-contained and alien principle, and freedom from them for them essentially means that they can adapt themselves to this reality by active or passive means, instead of by having to deal with it according to a uniform plan. In the present economic system, society appears to be as blind as sub-rational nature, for men do not use communal reflection and decision to regulate the process by which they earn their living in association with others. Instead, the production and distribution of all the goods needed for life take place amid countless uncoordinated actions and interactions of individuals and groups. In the totalitarian state, the heightening of external oppositions has only seemingly relaxed those within. In fact, the latter are simply covered up in all sorts of ways. Now, as formerly, though, now, as formerly, though now awareness of it is suppressed, the war and peace politics of Europe is still dominant. Even if, when still dealing with economic problems, even if, when dealing with economic problems, concern for the system as such takes precedence over economic motives in the narrower side, since in Lenz politics, for the moment, the air of greater consistency and unity. History in the modern era is not like a planted struggle of mankind with ma nature and the uninterrupted development of all its aptitudes and powers, but like a meaningless ebb and flow to which the individual according to his class situation can respond more or less shrewdly at the heart of the freedom and seemingly seeming originality of the entrepreneur who's calling contributions to the heightening of his authority there is a there is an adaptation to a social situation in which mankind does not control its own destiny subjection to a purposeless process instead of rational regulation of it dependence on an irrational condition of society which one must try and profit by instead of shaping it in its totality in brief, within this freedom there lurks an originality an originally it, within this freedom there lurks an originally inevitable and now retrogressive surrender of freedom, an acceptance of the blind power of chance, a long since discredited authority relationship. This dependence of the entrepreneur arising out of the irrational character of the economic process is manifested in helplessness before deepening crises and a universal perplexity perplexity even among the leaders of the economy. Bankers, manufacturers, and merchants, as well as the characteristic literature of recent centuries, shows how uh, shows have completely divested themselves of humility. But simultaneously, they have come to experience social reality as a superordinate blind power, and contrary to medieval practice, have allowed their relationships to other men to be ruled by a faceless economic necessity. Thus, a new and powerful authority has come into being. In decisions of, on the fate of man, the hiring and firing of the laboring masses, the ruins of the farmers over the whole sectors of the world, the unleashing of wars, and so on, caprice has been replayed not by freedom, but by blind economic necessity. An anonymous god who enslaves men and is invoked by those who have no power over him, but have received advantages from him. Men in power have ceased to act as representatives of heavenly and earthly authority, and consequently have become mere functions of the laws inherent in their power. It is not their boasted and their decision that motivates the apparently free entrepreneurs, but a soulless economic dynamism. 
and they have no way of of opposing this state of affairs except by surrendering their very existence. The fullest possible adaptation of the subject to the reified authority of the economy is the form which reason takes in the bourgeois society. As the whole of the entrepreneur in the process of production shows how illusory the philosophical rejection of the authority was, so too does the life of the worker. It is well known that the worker became antiquated only late in history with the idea of external freedom in the sense of a free choice of calling, and even then under severe restrictions due to poverty under severe restrictions due to poverty in the first half of the 15th century when the economy was shifting to cattle raising the latter the landowners drove their tenants from the land by force and trickery thus they liberated the workers in a negative way that is they stripped them from every means of earning a living but in the circumstances of european history such liberation did not mean that the worker could now choose his own place and type of work the mass executions of tramps in this period introduced the long history of the free workers wretchedness from the end of the 17th century on when factories which had existed in Italy as early as the 13th century, gradually acquired importance alongside home industries. They were places of horror. Their usual connection with orphanages, asylums, and hospitals did not mean that the place of worship was simultaneously a hospital, but rather that the hospital became a workplace and that men died of toil rather than of illness. The doctrine that the isolated individual determines his own destiny showed its full social implications only in the 1830s in liberal England, but it had already found clear enough expression in previous centuries in the mercilessness in which men were forced to labor in mines and factories. Antiquity in the early Middle Ages were periods of cruelty. Antiquity in the middle, early Middle Ages were periods of cruelty, but with increasing need for workers and growing economy of free exchange, the compulsion upon the masses to submit to killing labor was rationalized into a moral imperative. Correspondingly, measures were taken not only against the poor, but against all helpless people, children, the aged, the ill. The 16 edict, uh, 1618 edict of the great elector on the establishment of houses of correction, spinning rooms, and factories in which all men without work along with their children should be gathered by force, if, ne uh, by force, if necessary, was aimed at not only strengthening the textile industry, but also at habituating shrinkers to work. Such a move is typical of the mentality of the time, but the mentality persisted through the 18th century. Frederick the Great regarded it as so important for the children to be kept busy that during his stay at uh, Hirschberg in Silesia in 1766, he offered to send the merchants a thousand children, 10 to 12 years old, to be used for spinning. The refusal of the offer aroused his deep pleasure. He sent orphans to a businessman who complained of the quality of workers imported from Holland and Denmark. In 1788, children from the Potsdam Orphanage were transferred to another manufacturer. France, England, and Holland regarded it as thoroughly permissible to use children from the age of four on as workers in home industries and factories generally, and obviously to use the elderly and the ill in the same way. Rarely do we come across a law protecting children from the mines. The workday was nevertheless the workday was nevertheless thirteen hours than thirteen hours and was frequently even longer. <clears throat> There was no question of the workers' free choice. Workers in the home industries could not work for foreign employers, nor could those in the factories leave their place of work without the employer's permission. When children ran away after being forced into various workshops with or without their family's consent, they were recaptured with the help of authorities. Strikes were severely punished, and wages were deliberately kept low with the approval or even at the express orders of the government. Spinoza's friend and patron, and patron, patron DeWitt, demanded an official lowering of wages. The conviction was widespread that as long as a worker had money in his pocket or the smallest credit, he would fall into the vice of idleness. That is, in more realistic terms, he would absolutely refuse to submit to the murderous working conditions. Such was the typical economic thinking of the 18th century that it took the progressiveness of a turgot to criticize seriously the practice of keeping workers in factories against their will and the whole life experience of a Voltaire to establish the fact that labor can turn from necessity to scourge. Man is born for action, Voltaire wrote in 1720, as, fires and stone, as fire rises and stone falls, to be inactive and not to exist are the same thing for him. To, the only difference is between peaceful or troubled, dangerous or useful occupation. Fifty years later, he added another sentence to the passage. Job is rightly said, or Job is rightly said, man is born for sorrow as the bird for flight, but the flying bird can be taken in the snare. He has, I believe it is Job. Uh, our concern here, however, is not the contradiction between the existence of the masses, who were in, not indeed serfs, but were exploited in the most terrible way, and the doctrine of man's freedom and dignity, which is dominant over philosophy ever since Pico della Mirandola's time. We are concerned rather with one element of the work relationship in modern times, namely the camouflaging of authority as it actually operates for the worker. In the work system, which was set up almost everywhere in the 19th century Europe, the relationship between employer and workers was based on the so-called free contract, even when workers banded together in trade unions and partially surrendered their own freedom of movement by commissioning their officers to negotiate contracts 
The contracts are ultimately the decision of the workers. The establishment of relations between the independent manufacturers and the industrial workers is, within the limits set by imperial law, the object of free agreement, said the trade regulations of the German Empire. But the empire, sorry, but the freedom had other and more important limits than those set by imperial law. Limits arising not out of nature or of low-level development of human powers, but out of the particular character of the dominant form of society, and yet seeming to be unchangeable limits which men could only accept. When both parties in the work relationship passed as free, there was an unwitting abstraction from the fact that pressure to enter the relationship operated indifferently on each side. The worker was poor and was competing against his whole class at the national and international levels. Behind each worker waited hunger and misery. His contracting partner, on the contrary, had on his side not only the means of production, a broader horizon, influence on the power of state, and the whole range of propaganda possibilities, but credit as well. This distinction between rich and poor was socially conditioned, established and maintained by men, and yet it pretended to be a necessity of nature, as though men could do nothing to modify it. The individual worker was more deeply dependent on the settlement of a contract than his partner, and, for the most part, found the conditions already established to which he must adapt himself. The conditions were not by any means arbitrarily devised and dictated by the businessman. On the contrary, the latter could easily point out the limitations he was under to in the union official, well, to the union officials who sought certain improvements. <clears throat> His ability to compete with other businessmen at home and abroad, this very reference, which the unions had to acknowledge as valid, manifested the essential trait of the dominant system, namely that the kind of in context of work was determined not by the conscious will of society, but by the blind interaction of unintegrated forces. This was the trait which determined the businessman's lack of freedom. The distinction between employer and worker lay in the fact that this impersonal necessity, which, in which, of course, the whole conscious effort of individuals and peoples, along with the political and cultural system, played an important part, represented for the employer the condition for his control and for the worker a pitiless fate. <clears throat> Submission to economic circumstances, which the worker accepted in free contract, was also in submission to the private will of the employer. In acknowledging the authority of economic facts, the worker was in practice acknowledging the power and authority of the employer. To the extent that he acknowledged the kind of idealistic doctrines of freedom, equality, and absolute sovereignty of reason, which were widely held in the last century, in the extent that he felt himself to be free, even amid conditions, <coughs> the real conditions that prevailed, his consciousness was in fact the outcome of ideology. For the reigning authorities were not cast down from their place, but simply had hidden themselves behind the anonymous power of economic necessity, or as the phrase was, behind the voice of facts. The effort to ground in apparently natural circumstances and to present as inescapable the dependence which men experienced even within a bourgeois society which, until the beginning of its most recent phrase, rejected the irrational authority of persons and other forces, provides the conscious and unconscious motivation for part of the literature on cultural histori uh, history. Submission to an external will is justified not by a simple acceptance of tradition, but by a supposed insight into the eternal matters of fact. A typical textbook on national economy has this to say. Insofar as the objective nature of work for an employer has effects that are regarded as, or are for in fact unfavorable, this is inescapable. As we pointed out earlier, work for another demands in all circumstances a, person, a personal subordination, a submission of one's own will to that of a leader or director, and therefore brings with it a distinction of political, of social position that will always be unavoidable. Insofar as a large part of such work involves danger to life and health as a greater loss of comfort as and well-being and than other kinds of work do, we are faced with evils, assuming the necessity of work to supply the goods men need, that are unavoidable and must ever be endured by one or other sector of society. There is no work system that can eliminate them. If books like the ones quoted show some friendliness to workers, it usually takes the form of insisting that improvement is surely possible in many factors which make the work relationship disadvantageous to the work, such as external work conditions, place and time of work, wages. But there is also the presupposition of the connection of leadership with a pleasant life <coughs> and work for others which a diff and work for others with a difficult life as well as the assignment of the two ways of life to a particular social groups are unchangeable in fact however this view turns an, a historical an historical situation into a super historical one for such a distribution of work and of the participation of the gifts of fortune corresponds to a particular stage in the development of human powers and their instruct instrumentalities and as history moves on it loses its productive value. The bourgeois conception of work, according to which subordination is determined no longer by birth, but by free contract between private persons, and it is not the employer, but the economic situation 
that imperiously pressures men into subordinate roles, and in fact is an extremely productive and benevolent outcome, beneficial outcome. There was objective justification for dependence on an employer and on the social forces behind them in the form of adaptation to a seemingly purely natural necessity. And for obedience to the person whose wealth made him a leader out of production, this state of affairs corresponded to the difference between the difference between capabilities of the undeveloped masses and those of the educated upper stratum, as well as to the fact that the techniques for guiding and ordering industry were as yet insufficiently rationalized due to adequate machinery, inadequate machinery in an undeveloped system of communication. That men should learn to adapt to a hierarchy was a condition for the immediate growth and productivity, and a sense ensued in addition for the evolution of individual self-awareness. Consequently, the hidden and me mediated authority, though for a long time merciless, was yet reasonable in terms of historical development. The irrational shape it took, however, means that it arose not from the historical situation, that is, from the relationship between human capabilities and functions determined in advance by the mode of production, but from objectified anonymous necessity. Such necessity seems to, be per seems to persist when leadership of production by private and competing interests and groups of interests, once a condition of cultural progress, <gasps> has long since become problematic. The attitude of the modern period to authority thus turns out to be less simple than it appears to be in the clear and the attitude of the modern period to authority thus turns out to be less simple than it appears to be in the clear and decisive proportions of many thinkers. The freedom claimed in philosophy is an ideology that is a condition that seems necessary because of a specific form of the social life process. Both the social group of which we have been speaking could therefore fall in victim to it. For each of them, in characteristic ways, according to its place in the process of production, was blind to its own and freedom and that of the other group. Unfreedom here means a dependence, not grounded in reason, on the ideas, decisions, and actions of other men. That is, it means precisely what bourgeois thinkers objected to about the Middle Ages. One bends circumstances, adapts to reality, acceptance of the authority relationship between classes does not take the direct form of acknowledging an inherited claim of the upper classes, but consists in the fact that men regard economic data, for example, the subjective valuations of goods, prices, legal forms, property relationships, and so forth, as immediate or natural forces, and that they are adapting themselves to such facts when they submit to the authority relationship. This complicated structure of authority has its had its great flowering under liberalism, but in the period of the totalitarian state, too, it offers a key to understanding of men's patterns and reaction. Relations of dependence in the economy, which are fundamental for social life, may be fully derived in theory from the state, but that state itself should be unconditionally accepted by the masses, uh, but that the state itself should be unconditionally accepted by the masses is possible only because such relationships of dependence have not become a problem for them as of yet. Consequently, it is a mistake to try and identify the authority structure of the present period with the relations between leaders and followers and to regard the acceptance of such hierarchies as, fu as fundamental. On the contrary, the new authority relationship is the new authority relationship, which is the foreground of thought and feeling today, is itself possible only because that other authority relationship, a more everyday but also a deeper reality, has not yet lost its power. The political leadership is effective because great masses of men consciously and unconsciously accept their economic dependence as necessary or at least not fully realize it yet. And this situation is in turn consolidated by the political leadership. Once men refuse the de facto relationship of dependence in the economy, once theoretical understanding breaks down the seemingly unconditional economic necessity, once authority in the bourgeois sense collapses, the new authority, too, loses its strongest ideological basis. Therefore, an indiscriminate con condemnation of authority regimes without regard for the underlying economic structure misses the essential point. The formation and continuance of rational authority relationships in undisguised forms is amongst the factors which strengthen the deeper economic relationship, and the two influence each other. This is already obvious from the spread of Protestantism. This whole political, religious, and philosophical literature of the modern period is filled with praise of authority, obedience, self-sacrifice, and the hard fulfillment of duty. These exhortations, which take on a more austere quality as their addresses' uh, ability to respond to them lessens, are more or less, as their addressees' ability to respond to them lessens, are more or less artificially and ingeniously linked with rallying words like reason, freedom, happiness for the largest possible number, and justice for all. Yet, in 
such exhortations, the dark side of the reigning state of affairs is manifested. Since the modern mode of production began, it has been found necessary to heighten the already forcible language of economic facts, not only by pressure from politics, religion, and morality, but also by reverent or ecstatic or masochistic awe men feel before holy and demonic persons and powers. Thus, when philosophy after the First World War was helping prepare the way for the victory of authoritarian regimes, it could help appeal to a long tradition. Max Scheler criticized even the bourgeois thinkers like Hobbes for thinking, or for trying, quote, to ground the content and essence of good and evil for themselves in the norms and commands issuing from authority, end quote. He himself takes precautions against helping the cause of this so-called ethics of authority, instead directly deifies the intrinsic moral value of authority he claims indeed that it is that in problems of theoretical knowledge there is no authority and any claims such are rightly to be met by the principle of freedom of research but he also maintains that we can gain insight into the moral values and claims that spring from them only on the basis of genuine authority by first accepting such values in practice without insight and in response to orders from authority shaler's thinking belongs in the transition from the liberal to the totalitarian form of the state Content and structure of the basic forms of authority is not a theme in the typical philosophers of uh, in typical philosophers of either period. Yet, the authority relationship shapes the features of the age and the nature of the human types which prevail in it. The present-day form of society, like earlier ones, rests upon its own characteristic relation of dependence. Even the apparently independent vocational and private relationships of men are determined by the dependence which is grounded in the mode of production and finds expression in the existence of social classes. The product of this dependence is the individual uh, who feels himself to be free, but acknowledges socially conditioned facts as unchangeable and pursues his own interest in the context of reality as given. Before the bourgeoisie run a share of political power, in political power, its outlook stressed that freedom and trust in individual reason, out of which morality and the essence of the state could be constructed after the fashion of mathematical projections. In the period of bourgeois dominance, under liberalism, this rationalistic temper gave way to the empiricist. But in the public life of the whole of age and ideological products, both elements stood more or less unconnectedly together. Spontaneity of human reason and, heter and heteronomy, freedom and blind obedience, independence and sense of weakness, lack of respect and critical admiration, intransigent intransigence in principle in perplexity in practice, formalistic theory and mindless accumulation of data, cultural institutions and activities, Church, school, literature, etc. keep such contradictions alive in the character of man. The impossibility of overcoming the contradictions in the given circumstances follows from the fact that individuals think that they are acting freely, whereas in fact the basic traits of social order remain uninfluenced by such isolated beings. Men, therefore, continue simply to accept and conform where they might be shapers and to do without the freedom they never need more urgently, namely to regulate and direct the social work process and thereby human relations generally in a more reasonable way, that is, according to a unified plan in the interests of the generality. A good instance of the liberal, as he still exists in a relatively strong bourgeois community, presents a picture of freedom, openness, and goodwill. He knows himself to be the very opposite of a slave, yet his sense of justice and his clarity of purpose operates within definite limits set by the economic mechanism and do not find expression in an ordering of social reality as a whole. These limits, which he accepts, may change for him and everyone else in a moment's notice, so that he and his might may so that he and his might become beggars through no fault of their own. Even in his freedom, kindness, and friendliness, the limits make their presence felt. He is less his own master than he first appears. His sense of personal inter independence and his corresponding respect for the freedom and dignity of his fellows are noble, but abstract and naive as well. There is one social fact, the acceptance of which, as natural, most immediately sanctions the existing relations of dependence, and that is the distinction of poverty. The poor man must work hard to live. As a structural averse uh, army of industry swells, he must even regard his work as a great benefit and privilege, and he does so to the extent that he belongs to the bourgeois, the authority-oriented type. The free sale of his powers of work is the condition for the growth of power in the overlords, yet the discrepancy between merit and power in both cases grows beyond all belief. With the, increasingly irration with the increasing irrationality of the system, the special isolated talents which earlier offered some chance at greater success and justified the Horatio Alger stories of the proper proportion between merit and reward become ever more indifferent as compared with the extrinsic factors in a person's destiny and the proportion disproportion between the good life and the hierarchy of human qualities becomes ever clearer. In the portrait of a just society, principles of reason determine each person's share in what society rests from nature. In society as it is, however, the sharing depends on chance. Acceptance of such a situation is the same as worship of success, that god of the modern world. Success is not meaningfully related to effort, which may surpass 
that of others in power, intelligence, and progressiveness. The brute fact that a man has reached success and has power, money, and connections is what lifts him above all of others and forces others into his service. The, the consciously cultivated reign of social justice has withdrawn into the courtroom, and apart from political issues, there seems to be busy essentially with theft and murder. Seems there to be busy essentially with theft and murder. The blind sentence passed by the economy, that mightier social power which condemns the greater part of mankind to senseless wretchedness and crushes countless human talents is accepted as inevitable and, un and recognized in practice in the conduct of men. Universal injustice is thus surrounded by the halo of necessity and is, according to modern philosoph according to modern philosophically oriented piety, not to be compensated for even by a real hell and by the heaven of the blessed. Such an outlook reacts, of course, on the justice and law court and devalues its good efforts, not only because those who are its objects have usually already been condemned at the economic judgment seat before they ever committed their crimes, but even in thoughts and feelings of the judges themselves. In a period when this order of things was flourishing, reason seemed operative in the distribution of happiness and prestige. Today, that order is bereft of every meaningful necessity, since the equalization of functions and work and the comprehensibility of the apparatus of production are so far advanced while human capabilities and social wealth have grown as well. Yet, no one is responsible for limitations on freedom. And yet, no one is responsible. For limitations on freedom are also limitations on conscience. Everyone must look out for himself. Every man for himself, the watchword of the ruthless anarchic masses in the face of destruction, underlies the whole of bourgeois culture. If world history in general is a judgment passed on the world, its particular verdicts take the form of the selection of parents, the state of the labor market, and the rates of exchange. The order of pre precedence in a society is not expressly accepted as justified, but is accepted as necessary, and thus, after all, as justified. Authority is soulless, yet seemingly rational. Man's naive faith in it finds expression in the idea of a wise God whose ways are marvelous and obscure. The doctrine of predestination, according to which no man knows whether he has been chosen for eternal life or has been rejected, reflects the same naive truth. Interesting that he should be writing this, by the way, because Horkheimer is Jewish, and the Jews never had any idea of predestination besides, you know, small sex. Anyways, uh, such authority in the sense of accepted dependence is not manifested in religion alone, however, but in all of man's artistic and everyday ideas. Even purely objective authority, such as the knowledge of a doctor has, is effect, uh, such as knowledge a doctor has, is affected by it. He has the good fortune, due to a series of accidental configurations of circumstances, to get an education and win influence. But this good fortune then appears to him and his patience to be the result rather of greater talent and superior human worth. In other words, an inborn quality rather than a socially conditioned one. This kind of awareness finds stronger expression the less a patient has to offer the doctor in terms of position, wealth, or at least an interesting illness. The essential characteristic of this order of things is that work is done under the guidance of authorities who are such because of possessions and other accidents of fortune are increasingly unable to appeal to any other ground for their authority than that this is the way things are. This trait colors everything that passes today for reason, morality, honor, and greatness. Even real merit surpassing knowledge and practical ability are affected and distorted by it. They are regarded less as widely distributed as a widely distributed blessing than a legal title for power and exploitation. The respect given to them by blank account two is given them by blank account two and elevates the moneyed man still higher by clothing him in a genius alike in the same aura of splendor. Nietzsche more clearly than anyone else saw the connection between idealism and the state of affairs we have been describing. Hegel, he says, implanted in a generation leavened throughout him by the worship of the power of history that practically every, that turns practically every moment into a sheer gasping, gaping at success into an idolatry of the actual for which we have now discovered the characteristic phrase to adapt ourselves to circumstances. But the man who has once learned to crook the knee and to bow the head before the power of history nods yes at last like a Chinese doll to every power, whether it is a government or a public opinion or a numerical majority, and his limbs move correctly as the power pulls the strings. If each success have come by rational necessity and every event show the victory of logic or the idea, then down on your knees quickly. And let every step in the ladder of success have its reverence. There are no more living mythologies, you say? Religions are their last gasp? Look at the religion of the power of history. In the priests of the mythology of ideas, with their scare, scarred knees, do not all the virtues follow in the train of the new faith? And shall we not call it unselfishness when the historical man lets himself be turned into an objective mirror of all that is? It is not magnanimity to renounce all power in heaven and earth in order to adore the mere fact of power? Is it not justice always to hold the balance of forces in your hand and observe which is the stronger and heavier? 
The simple fact that in modern times, the external circumstances of having property gives a man power to dispose of others reduces to secondary rank all the other valuational norms which currently play a role in public life. Social groups which must achieve stability within the existing order and which hope to better position the better their position in it will maintain a faith in the inevitability of the basic situation, even though it has long since become a ball and chain. There has to be some authority. And by this they mean not so much the really effective authority, the one based on private property, as the authority of the state which forces them to uh, as the authority of the state, which forces them to submit to the very real authority and takes all decision out of their hands. The effort to sustain this frame of mind and to propagate it as widely as possible amongst the population as a whole is a work in all areas of intellectual life. The resultant affirmation of this given social hierarchy and at the end of the mode of production in which it rests as well as all the other psychic impulses and forms of consciousness connected with this affirmation form one of the intellectual elements by which culture proves to be the cement holding together society with deep cracks in its walls. The great psychic energy needed if one is to escape the prevailing outlook is not to be identified with an anarchistic rejection of authority nor with the trained judgment of the expert who can distinguish genuine ability from charlatanry. To the extent that it, the expert judgment concentrates on its object in isolation, it does not do the object justice, for it does not show how genuine accomplishments in arts and science are in opposition to the prevailing trend. On the other hand, the radically anti-authority attitude of the anarchist is but an exaggeration of the bourgeois awareness of personal freedom as something to be always and everywhere realized if one but wills it so in other words the anarchist attitude flows from the idealist view that material conditions play no role but in fact the work process as found in human history requires very diverse kinds of knowledge for its effectiveness and to reject the distinction between the management and exec and execution functions in work is not only utopian but would mean retrogression in the primitive ages of man the genuine alternative to the bourgeois concept of authority takes place uh, it takes the form of detaching authority from egoistic interests and exploitation. Such an alternative is bound up with the idea of a higher form of society as possible today. If only the management and execution functions of work are not connected with a well-off and poor life respectively, nor divided between such social classes, can the category of authority acquire a new significance. Individualistic society capabilities are two are a possession which one converts into capital and generally they derive partly from capital that is from a good education and from the encouragement which success brings if the goods men need in order to live no longer originate in an economy of seemingly free producers of whom some because of poverty must hire themselves out to others while the latter manufacture goods not according to human needs but according to what their own solvency requires and if instead such goods originate in the rationally guided efforts of mankind then the freedom of the abstract individual who proves really to be in chains will become the collaborative work of concrete men whose genuine freedom will be limited only by the nat by nature and its necessities in disciplined work men will take their place under an authority but the authority will only be carrying out the plans that men have made and have decided to implement the plans themselves will no longer be the result of divergent class interests for the latter will have lost their foundations and be converted into a communal effort the command of another will express his personal interests only because it also expresses the interests of the generality. The disciplined obedience of men who strive to bring the state of affairs to pass already reflects another conception of authority. The simple fact of unconditional subordination, then, is not an essential structural element in every authority relationship. The formalism which sets up reason and authority as alternatives and asks us to confess to the other one and despise the other, along with anarchism and the authoritarian view of the state, all these are expressions of one and the same cultural epic. <clears throat> I could better read as all these are expressions of one and the same cultural epic. But yeah, so that is the second essay by Horkheimer in Authoritat in La Familia, or however you say it in German, Authority in the Family. Uh, you know, it took a bit longer than the last one, but I believe this is actually a longer essay. And the last essay, I believe, is actually the longest of all of them, at looking like what's about 31 pages. And that will be family. And we'll do family next time. But I hope that you have learned something throughout this. Uh, you know, you can find all of Horkheimer's works pretty much for free online nowadays. Uh, I hope you've learned something. hope you're continuing to, you know, I, if, you've, if you're this far, then you have some sort of intellectual curiosity at the very least about critical theory, philosophy, and perhaps religion in general. And whether you come at this topic from a perspective of, yes, I want to go learn more about this because 
you know, my political side supports stuff that, you know, stems out from Marxism and critical theory, et cetera, or because you are on the side where you say, hey, this stuff terrifies me and it's going to destroy society. I think, I think most philosophers could go back in time and say, hey, Horkheimer, Adorno, and uh, whatnot, they were, they probably wouldn't be quite happy with either political spectrum, at least in America today. And so, you know, anachronistically attributing some stuff to them, uh, you know, it's best to go read their actual works and understand it for yourself rather than anachronistically apply, you know, modern positions to these men. So, yeah, I won't talk too much more and we'll go get on to family next time. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, deuces.